Hello and welcome to Bay College's video lectures for Intermediate Algebra. This is section 7.3 and it's applications of quadratic equations. Now, we see quadratics appear a lot in the real world when we have to deal with things that are two-dimensional. Um, an example of that would be area or motion, things of that nature. We, we come across quadratics all the time. So <clears throat> we're going to look at some application problems here. And the first one states that a rectangular auditorium seats 960 people. The number of seats in each row exceeds the number of rows by 16. Find the number of seats in each row. So if we want to understand what's happening here, maybe it would be helpful to draw an illustration. And if we read it again, it says a rectangular auditorium. So I'm just going to draw a rectangular shape here. And it seats 960 people. The number of seats in each row exceeds the number of rows by 16. So we know we have uh, rows in this auditorium. And each row has so many seats. And we're told that the number of seats in each row exceeds the number of rows. Find the number of seats in each row. So we have to determine what our variable is going to be. So when we do that, I'm going to assign x to the number of rows. So x is going to represent the number of rows, because I don't know how many rows there are. But I am told that the number of seats exceeds, so more than, 16 rows. So the number of seats is going to be the number of rows, my variable, plus 16. And if I multiply these, the number of rows times the number of seats will tell me the number of people who could be seated in this auditorium. And we are told that it seats 960 people. So the number of rows times the number of seats equals the total number of seats. And if I multiply this out, I get x squared plus 16x equal to 960. And because I notice it is a quadratic, I'm going to set it equal to 0 right now by subtracting 960. So we see to find the number of rows, because that was my variable, I have a quadratic equation that I can solve for. Now, because I know that there is a whole number of seats, I'm going to assume that this is factorable. And it is factorable because I did the work ahead of time. So I, you know, I knew what, what I was doing for you. So <clears throat> this is factorable. Uh, and the, the two numbers that have a difference of 16, if I factor this, I get uh, negative 24 and positive 40. 24 times 40 is uh, 960. And the difference of 40 and negative 24 is a positive 16. So now I can use the zero factor theorem that we discussed before. What would make this factor 0 would be positive 24. What would make this factor 0 would be negative 40. Now, if we think about it, the number of rows, well, we're not going to have a negative number of rows, which would make this an extraneous solution. So we would have 24, uh, 24 rows of seats. So did we find the answer? Well, let's reread the question. It says a rectangular auditorium that seats 960 people. There are seats in each row that exceeds the number of rows by 16. Find the number of seats. Well, the variable that I chose here was the number of rows. I found the number of rows. But the question asked to find the number of seats. Well, I know that this is my rows, because that was the variable I chose. And this was my seats. So I can take my value that I found, the number of rows plus 16 is the number of seats. So 24 plus 16, there are 40 seats per row in this auditorium, the number of seats in each row. So we did answer the question. And we used a quadratic equation to find that answer. All right, let's look at another example. Here we have a uh, distance, rate, and time equation. So hopefully we know uh, that distance equals rate times time. Or we can use any variation of that equation. Maybe we want to know in relative to time, which would be distance over rate. Or maybe we want to know 
rate, which is distance over time. So any variation of this equation I'm going to use here. When I read this, I know it's a distance uh, time or rate equation because it says Amy travels 240 miles, which is a distance, to a conference. Her husband drove to meet her there later. Her husband's speed, uh, a rate, was 4 miles per hour faster than hers. Her husband's time, another variable, all three of them are there, was 15 minutes less. Find both of their average speeds. So I read it. I understand what's happening here. I know I'm giving a distance, a rate, and something about time. So I can set up an equation at this point. If I reread it, the distance they travel is 240 miles. And they're both going to the same location from the same spot. Uh, her husband's speed is 4 miles per hour faster than hers. Well, I don't know what her speed is. So I'm going to say uh, this is Amy's rate. And her husband's rate, I'm told, is 4 miles an hour faster. So this is the husband. Now, <clears throat> what I'm told about time and uh, distance is that they travel the same distance because they're going to the same location. So the distance is the same. That's good news. I'm also told about time. So, but I'm not told much about time, just that his time was 15 minutes less. So if we think about this, I, we're going to end up using, um, let's see, the time equation. Because we want to put things in terms of time. So her rate is uh, the distance they travel, which is given information 240 over rate. Distance over rate is her time that it takes her to travel to that conference. The time that her husband takes is going to be 240 miles, the same amount of distance. And the rate that he travels is Amy's rate plus 4 miles an hour faster. Now, since this is a time and this is a time, because time is distance over rate, I know that his time was 15 minutes less. So in order for their times to be equal, I would have to subtract 15 from one of them or add 15 to one of them to make them equal. So if Amy's uh, distance, or excuse me, time is 240 over x, his is 240 over x plus 4 less 15 minutes, because his was 15 minutes less. So uh, his time to be equal to hers, I would have to add 15 minutes. Now, here's the thing. We always have to be careful about units, because our rates are in miles per hour. Hour is the unit of time. But we were told something about minutes. So we have to do a little conversion. And hopefully, we're comfortable with converting uh, time to, uh, you know, from minutes to hours. So 15 minutes is 1 quarter of an hour. So we have this in units of hours. Her distance over rate is her time. Distance over rate is his time plus a quarter so that they would be equal. All right, so now to solve this, I would have to multiply this equation to get rid of these fractions. We don't want to work with fractions. And in chapter uh, 5, we worked with working with rational expressions. So we're going to solve this equation by multiplying both sides of this equation by the LCD. Well, the LCD is 4x and x plus 4. We don't know what these values are. Well, his, this value is 15 minutes less. To make it equal, I have to add 1 fourth of an hour. Okay. Her time is more. Yes. So I would have to subtract a quarter from this side to make it equal to his time. OK. okay. It, 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 okay. It'll still work out. All right, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and multiply through by that. LCD of x and x plus 4. And what I do to one side of the equation, I have to do to the other. And when I multiply this by this term, the x's cancel. 
So I can distribute 240 to this. So I get 240x plus 960. When I distribute this to this term, the x plus 4's will cancel. And I get 240x. And when I distribute this, oh, I'm forgetting my factor of 4. We'll put that in there. And we'll come back to that. So when I multiply this times this quantity, the x plus 4's cancel. And I have 4 times 240x. When I multiply these, the 4's cancel. So I'm left with x times x plus 4. And now we can do a little bit more simplification to get a nice quadratic. If I multiply this by 4, I'm going to get uh, 960x. Well, let's write it over here, 960x. This times 4 is going to give me, let's see, 3,600 and 240, 3840. And that's going to be equal to 960x plus x squared plus 4x. Now, I see this squared term, and I know I can uh, write this as a quadratic in standard form by simply setting it equal to 0. So to set it equal to 0, I'm going to subtract 960 from both sides. And it actually cancels out. We had a 960x on both sides. And then I'm going to subtract 3,840. Essentially, I'm moving everything to the right. So I'll get x squared plus 4x minus 3,840 equal to 0. Now, again, this factors. But these, these numbers are not friendly. So maybe you might want to use the quadratic formula in order to work with this and a calculator, because this is a relatively large number. But it does factor. It factors to x, let's see, x plus, or no, minus 60, and x plus 64. And now if we use the zero value or zero factor theorem, we get x is 60 or negative 64. Well, again, we're dealing with, uh, in this case, x represents a speed. A negative speed really doesn't make sense. Someone's not going to be driving to a destination in reverse, right? A negative speed. So, or whatever, right? So 60 miles an hour is x. Well, what did x represent? Well, I chose x to be Amy's rate. x is 60. Well, 60 what? What is the unit of our rates? It's miles per hour. 60 miles per hour. And that seems like a reasonable rate if we're traveling on the highway. So I can uh, pretty much you know, count that that's a reasonable answer. But did I answer the question? It says they both traveled 240 miles to this conference. They were going at different rates. They, it took them different times. Find both of their average speeds. Well, I only found Amy. This is Amy's speed, 60 miles per hour. Her husband is going 4 miles an hour faster. Well, that's what we're told here. And 60 plus 4 is 64. So 64 miles per hour. So Amy was going 60, and her husband was going 64. Hopefully, he didn't get a ticket, right? All right, so let's look at another example. We have the Bay Travel Club is planning a trip with a total cost of $2,000, which is to be divided among the members attending. Before the trip, five members decide not to go. If the cost per person increased by $20, how many people will go on the trip? So I've read it the first time, and I understand the terminology that's uh, happening here. And if I read it again, I'm going to pull the given information. I know that this trip is going to cost $2,000. And that cost is going to be covered by the members attending. Well, we divide that cost among the members. So if I have, well, let's write it over here. If I have 2,000 people go, or $2,000, and it's divided amongst x people, 
That is the cost per person. Then it says five members decided not to go. Well, now of that $2,000, it has to be distributed over five less people. Now, it also says that if the cost per person increased by 20, how many people will go on the trip? Well, this was the initial cost per person. It increased by 20 to give us a new cost. So we'd have to set these equal. Now we're ready to actually solve this equation. Now, to solve it, we have to get rid of what's in the denominators. We want a nice uh, equation without any uh, variables in denominators. We can multiply through by the LCD, just like we did in the last example. Well, the LCD here, there's only the two fractions, x and x minus 5 are my denominators. And I have to assume that they're prime, so I'm just going to multiply that and this side. Because what I do to one side, I have to do to the other. And when I multiply this through, the x minus 5's cancel, or reduce to 1, 2,000 times x. And that's going to equal, well, I have to distribute here because I have two terms. This times that value, the x's will cancel. And it'll give me 2,000x. Let's see, uh, minus 10,000. Minus 10,000. And then I have to multiply it by this. This would be 20x squared minus 100. And now if I go to simplify this equation, well, I notice that it is a quadratic because of that x squared term. So I want to set it equal to 0. Well, if I subtract 2,000 from both sides, this would be equal to 0. And I'm going to write it in descending order. We have 20x squared minus 100x minus 10,000. And this equation is now equal to 0 when I combine all my terms and make sure I have my variables where they belong. And I, just uh, to simplify this, I notice that 20, 100, and 10,000 have a common factor. So I'm going to divide that out of all the terms. And I'll take it over here. I'm going to get x squared minus 5x minus 500 equals 0. Now, this number, not too friendly. It's you know, a little bit larger and has lots of factors. So if I tried to factor it, I might uh, spend a, a lot of time working through that. But it does factor. So maybe you want to use the quadratic formula or something else. But I'm going to factor it. It factors. The factors of 500 that have a difference of 5 are going to be 25 and 20, because 25 times 20 or yeah, is going to give me 500. Which one of these is the positive value? Which one is negative? Well, since they sum to a negative, the larger value is negative. So we can see that this would factor to x minus 25, that quantity times the quantity of x plus 20. That equals 0. Now we can use that 0 factor theorem x equals 25 or negative 20. 25 makes this factor 0. Negative 20 makes this factor 0. Now, if we just assess what we found here, well, x represents the number of people initially going on the trip. Well, we're not going to have a negative 20 as a number of people. So 25 is the number of people who are initially going on the trip. So let's reread the question. It says, how many people will go on the trip? So we don't want to know the initial. We want to know who's actually going. It says we have five less members. So we're going to take this value initially, less five members. We have 20 people going on the trip. So 20 is the answer. One more example, and this is an example that we often see in physics where we have this equation here, h equals negative 16t squared plus v naught times t plus h naught. And let's define what these variables mean. The h, this one right here, uh, tells me what the height is of an object at any time t. And t is my variable of time. And they're measured height is in feet, and time is in seconds. 
v naught is just a number. It's a coefficient. It's, in this case, it would be my b term. It just means the initial velocity. If something is going to be fired into the air, it's going to start at a certain rate, a, a certain velocity. And that has units of feet per second. h naught, just like h, is a height, but it's an initial height, because I may not be firing it from the same point at which it's going to land. So it's its initial height, which is also in feet. So let's take a look at, after defining that, let's take a look at an example of where we might see that. It says an arrow is shot vertically, straight up, I suppose, from a platform that is 41 feet high at a rate of 187 feet per second. How long does it take the arrow to hit, or how long, yeah, how long does it take the arrow to hit the ground? Well, if we think about this, maybe it's helpful to draw an illustration, which I did here. We have a platform that's 41 feet. That's what we're told. And from that platform, an arrow is shot up. Initially, it's going 187 feet per second. But after we fire something, we have this thing called gravity that's going to be pulling it back down. So we have to take that in consideration. This is actually my v naught, and this is my h naught. It's the initial height. It's a platform that's above the ground. Here's the ground. So what does, what's the behavior of that arrow? An arrow is going to be shot up, and gravity is going to pull it back down. So in this illustration, I show the white shows the arrow going up, and this color shows the arrow coming down and hitting the ground. And that's what the question asks. At what time does it hit the ground? So let's put in the information we know and see what we can find. Well, one more thing we need to define is what is the height that we're looking for? Well, it's hitting the ground. The ground is our reference point. It is 0 feet from the ground. The ground is at the ground. The platform is 41 feet high. So if we think about it, the height that we want to find is 0 when it's hitting the ground. So we have negative 16 t squared, the time, what we're asked to find how long is denoting a time, plus the initial velocity, which is how fast the arrow is when it's first fired up, times the time, plus the initial height. Well, the initial height was 41 feet. So now we have a quadratic equation. And this one does not give us a nice integer answer like most things. Uh, in nature, it's going to be something that maybe we want to use a calculator on. So I'm going to actually leave this for you to use the quadratic formula. It's good practice from what we covered in the last section. And work this out. And you're going to get two answers, but only one of them is correct. Because in the real world, we're looking for time. Time is always positive. So you would exclude the extraneous answer of a negative time. And the answer you should get is 11.9 seconds. So go ahead and work that out. Check your work. Make sure you get this answer. And uh, keep doing the practice through repetition. Application problems are difficult. You got to work through them. And you got to just use those strategies, whether you're drawing an illustration or you're thinking through it critically. Keep practicing. This has been Section 7.3. Thank you for watching.